Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be multiplied unto you today. Thank you for joining us in worship on this particular morning. Uh, this is Good Friday, and we're glad that you are here. Um, someone has often said, when we consider the sufferings of our Lord, uh, it was horrible what he went through, and how could we call it good? How could we call it good? And the only answer we can come up with is because it was good for us. Amen. Jesus did it for us, and so it is good for us. Um, the scripture says there in the book of Hebrews that, are we okay? Can you hear me okay? You're an echo. Oh, I'm an echo. All right. Anyway, it says in, in Hebrews chapter 12 that, Consider Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of God. So he knew, in the midst of his suffering, he knew what the outcome would be, that it would be good for us. And so we're able to say today that it is Good Friday. Amen. Did everybody get a, a, a little insert here, a little bulletin this morning? Uh, I want to just kind of go over what we're going to do today. Uh, this service is a worship service. But it's really, uh, oftentimes, a Good Friday service could be a time of contemplation because we consider, once again, the sufferings of our Lord. And, and I, I mentioned last week that really 35%, 35% of the New Testament is written about the last week of Jesus' life. And if you read, for example, the Gospel account in the book of Matthew, it's about his trials and all the things that happened before his crucifixion and then his crucifixion. So many things are happening uh, in the gospel accounts. So let's begin today as we think about Jesus and his sufferings for us. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our Father, our God, we come before you in Jesus' name and we're thankful today for the privilege of being here. Lord, it is because of your great mercy it is because of your great work in dying for our sins that we have opportunity to be in the presence of God. You have made a way. You have made a new and living way for us to be together with the Father. And so, Lord, we rejoice in you today, and we con consider once again all that you have suffered for us. And, Lord, we want to give thanks in our hearts today because of your great love demonstrated through your Son, Jesus Christ. So thank you now, Lord. Meet us in this hour by your Holy Spirit. As we consider your word, as we, as we think about the words of Jesus, we pray that we may be once again um, put in a place of awe because of all that he suffered for us. Thank you now. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, if you have a hymnal, uh, let's turn, and we're going to sing... Uh, uh, this is like a, cruci a crucifixion hymn. It's called, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. It's number 82, 82 in the uh, hymnal, number 82. Let's sing the four verses of this song. Yes. 
If you have your hymnal, I invite you to turn to the back uh, to one of our scripture readings. It is number 667, entitled The Suffering Lamb. And this is taken from the book of Isaiah. And if you know the book of Isaiah, think about this, was written probably about 800 years before Jesus came. And Isaiah is writing here about this suffering servant and so aptly describes the suffering of our Lord many, many centuries before it ever happened. Obviously, this is an illustration of God's ability to write things through his authors, through his uh, prophets, about what his son would suffer. And Jesus fulfilled all that in the New Testament. So let's read it, number 667. Uh, I'll read the bold print, and you can respond together in the fine print. Who has believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and we shall see him. There is no beauty that we should desire. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare the generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was his grave. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. He had pleased the Lord to bruise him. He had put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall seek his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his land. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the grave, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he had poured out his soul unto death, and he was honored with the transgressors, and he did bear the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. God bless the reading of his word. Did you see Jesus in that passage? Yeah. Jesus was there. All right. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me, and I'm just going to be reading some other some passages. I, on, there was someone that came in. Would somebody check? I'm not sure if they came in and thought they couldn't come in. Would somebody just check that they're... Yeah. Um, but if you have a, a, a bulletin there, what I want to do today is talk about the last words of Jesus on the cross. The last words of Jesus on the cross. And uh, as we consider a passage of scripture, um, we recognize that all of the gospels, all of the accounts of the gospels tell of the crucifixion of Jesus. And we put them together and we see that there is a, a great coming together of all that Jesus said as he was dying on the cross. Let's pray together, can we? Father, we come before you in Jesus' name, and, and we thank you today for your word, and we pray, Lord God, that you would help us to see once again uh, the great suffering of our Lord Jesus Christ 
and how he did it for us. Bless our words today, and as we consider what Jesus said, we pray that we would be encouraged as we consider his words. Thank you now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. One of the things people... Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, one of the things we look at oftentimes is, what was the last thing that somebody ever said? What were the famous last words of people? And I looked up some of these today. There are some that are kind of humorous. There are some that are kind of sad. I have five illustrations. Uh, I thought this was kind of funny. There was a guy named James W. Rogers, and he was a murderer, and he was standing in front of uh, the firing squad, and, and they, they asked him, do you have any uh, last words? And he said, yes, bring me a bulletproof vest. <laughs> but there are others as well. We think about someone like Benjamin Franklin, who was 84 years old, and he was... Uh, in his deathbed, and his daughter told him, Dad, why don't you change positions in bed so you can breathe easier? And his, his last words were supposedly, a dying man can do nothing easy. <laughs> then we have someone like uh, Steve Jobs. Remember Steve Jobs? I think Apple is that his thing. Uh, oh, wow, oh, wow, oh, wow, were his recorded last words. Elvis Presley, he had a sleepless night the night before he died, and he told his fiancée, I'm going to the bathroom to read. Famous last words. Winston Churchill said, I'm bored with it all. Well, today we have someone, and we think about oftentimes, if someone says something at the end of their life, it must be important. Now, oftentimes, in the illustrations I just gave, people didn't know that they were about to die. And so they just said what was on their heart. But in, recorded in our gospel accounts, we have what we call the seven last words of Jesus. The seven last words of Jesus, which he spoke from the cross. Now, understand for a minute with me about crucifixion. Crucifixion was probably the, the worst type of capital punishment ever devised by mankind. Because what would happen on, on a cross is they would nail a person to the cross, and they would nail, and when we say he had nails in his hands, it would rip off, it, it rip off his hands if it was put right through the middle of his hands. It was more like here, uh, between the two bones by his wrist, so it would actually hold him up. And then he had nails between his feet, and they would basically hold him on the bottom. And what would happen is, the, the way it would be on the cross, you would have difficulty breathing. And it wasn't so much taking air in, but being able to push air out in order to get more air in. And so what would someone have to do is, they would have to push up on the, the nail that was on their feet in order to lift their body, in order to exhale, and then after a while, it would be too painful, so they would have to let back down, and all that pain would be back on your hands and on your wrist. Now, you know, if you hit your funny bone, you know how that feels when you hit your funny bone? Well, that particular, bo actual, that particular nerve runs right, right there by where Jesus would have had the nails in his hands. So if you imagine the feeling of that funny bone feeling all the time on the cross, so that we read later on in the gospel accounts that they knew it was the Sabbath day and they didn't want them to be on the cross on, on the Sabbath day. So you remember the story tells that they went to the first thief and they broke his legs and they broke the legs of the other thief. And the reason they would do that is because if their legs were broken, they wouldn't be able to push up and wouldn't be able to breathe. And so they would die of asphyxiation very quickly. Well, they came to Jesus, if you remember, and they found that he was already dead. And then they put a spear through his side. That was another way of verifying that he was dead. But interestingly enough, even in his death, Jesus fulfilled the prophecy that not a bone of his was broken. All right, so think about the agony that it was, the difficulty it would be just in saying anything because you are laboring being crucified on a cross. And here is Jesus who makes seven words. And if you have your uh, 
uh, bulletin there, I want to go through the first three. We'll sing a song, and then we'll talk about the other four. So the first statement, Jesus in the midst of excruciating pain, in difficulty of breathing, and then even more in difficulty of speaking, he says this first thing, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Now, this is recorded in Luke chapter 23, verses 33 and 34. It says, And when they had come to the place called Calvary, which Calvary is the place of a skull, that's what it looked like. When they came to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right hand and the other on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know. What they do. Now consider what, for a moment what this particular statement meant. Now Jesus, the one who was perfect, the one who had done no wrong, was um, treated with horrible uh, uh, indignity. They mocked him. They, they put a crown of thorns on him. They, they basically did all these different things. They, the Bible says they wagged their, their heads at him. As he's on the cross, they say, you know, you saved others. Can you save yourself? Bring, come down from the cross. And here these men then put him on the cross. The Romans nailed him to the cross, and they stuck him between two thieves. And here he is in all this uh, pain and agony, and, and he's being mocked. And the first words out of his mouth are these. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. To me, that is divine, divine forgiveness. Have you ever been wronged by someone else? You know the feelings that come to you when you're wronged by another person? You, our natural tendency is, I want to get back at them. In fact, I don't get mad, I get even. And Jesus had every right to get mad and to get even. The scripture says he, he told, he, I could call you know, six legions of angels to, to re rescue me. But instead of getting mad or getting even, Jesus said, Father, forgive them. Divine forgiveness is releasing people from the wrong that they have done and not holding it against them. He did not hold the fact that these men and all the people around them were hanging him on a cross. In fact, he was so understanding of their need that he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They don't realize that they're hanging the very Son of God on the cross. And Jesus offered to them forgiveness even when they did him wrong. The second statement of Jesus is a statement that he made to a man who was next to him. And if you read the gospel accounts, uh, in the book of Matthew, it, it says that the two robbers, when uh, they're called malefactors, which are basically criminals, when they were first up on the cross, both of them were echoing the words the people were mocking Jesus with. They, they echoed those particular words. And so both of them were mocking Jesus. But something happened in the life of the one robber. Maybe it was the words of Jesus when he said, Father, forgive them. Maybe that's what prompted him to go, how could this guy say that in the midst of his own crucifixion? But the one robber's heart changed. And it's recorded again in Luke 23, verses 39 through 43. It says, then one of the criminals who were, who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, if you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, do you not even fear God, seeing that you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. 
I asked this question. Maybe you've asked this question before. How could Jesus say that? Didn't he know this man? I mean, the man is on the cross next to Jesus because of the things he had done wrong. This man might have been, his life might have been filled with all kinds of evil things that he had done. How in the world could Jesus offer him paradise when they're about to die? What has this man done to deserve paradise? Could I personalize it again? What has any of us done to deserve paradise? Well, this man had done nothing. This man had done nothing. In fact, the only thing he did was at the very end of his life, just a few hours before he would die, he turned to the only one he could turn to in the midst of his need, and he asked, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And that's all it took. That's all it took. Jesus' response was assuredly, meaning I tell you the truth. I'm not making this up. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. Jesus offered this man who had lived a life, who, who knows, for himself probably, all his life. In the very last moments of his life, turned to the one who could offer him salvation, and Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. What an offer not only for him, but to recognize for all of us that salvation is a gift that God offers to those who believe. The third of the seven words of Christ uh, were spoken by Jesus in the book of John, chapter 19. And here's what it says in John 19, verses 25, 25 through 27. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Ironically, there's three Marys there. Mary must have been a popular name back then, don't you think? When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her into his own home. Now this is recorded by John, and he doesn't tell us who it is, but we know the disciple is John himself. John is the one who is standing at the, side, at the, at the foot of the cross, with Jesus' mother, Mary. Mary certainly probably is weeping. Uh, when, in, earlier in the, in the Gospel of Luke, when we read the story when Jesus was a baby and they took him to the temple, Joseph and Mary took him to the temple. And you remember the story when Zacharias, Zacharias held the baby and he said, now I can depart in peace for my eyes have seen your salvation. And after he said those words, he prophesied to Mary, and he said to Mary, a sword will, will, will basically thrust through your own heart. In other words, you're going to one day feel the pain of your son's death. And this came to fruition right here on this day. Here is Mary, the mother. Imagine if you were a mother and your son was on the cross. Your son is dying, and it's, a, it's an injustice that's being done to him. And you're standing there weeping. Maybe she was saying, my son, my son, my son. And Jesus looks down to his mother and he says, woman, behold your son. He's talking to John. He's talking to his mother. And then he says to John, behold your mother. Now, there's a couple things about this that just amaze me. The first one is this. You know the story of Jesus, that Jesus was the firstborn son of his mother. And the Bible records in other parts of the gospel that Jesus had brothers and sisters. It was a family of at least six or maybe more kids, because he had more than one sister and like three brothers. So it's like at least six kids. But he's the oldest child. 
What normally happens in culture with the oldest son, especially? He's responsible for his mother. And, we, and when we read the gospel accounts, we find that Joseph is not recorded at all in, in the time of Jesus' life as an adult. And so we kind of presume that Joseph might have died already. And so Mary is a widow. And so here's Jesus on the cross. He's suffering the agony of the cross. And in the midst of his agony, he looks down and he sees his mother. And who's he thinking about? He's not thinking about himself. He's thinking about his mother. And the responsibility he has for his mother And in the midst of her grief, when he's going through grief himself, in the midst of her grief, he says in its essence to her and to John, behold your son and behold your mother. He basically says, John, now I'm paraphrasing, John, would you take care of my mother? I'm the responsible one. Would you take care of my mother? And the text in the scripture says, and from that hour, that that disciple took her to his own home. In other words, John recognized what Jesus was saying, that Jesus was going to be gone, and now someone had to take care of Mary. And John, would you do it? And John did. Imagine the love of Jesus in the midst of his own suffering. He's more concerned about his mother than anything else. Now, the other aspect is this, and and, uh, think about this. He didn't call her mother, by the way. Did you notice that? He said, woman, woman, behold. And it wasn't a sign of disrespect. He had said the same thing when, when, remember, earlier in the Gospels, when she asked him to do something about this situation at this wedding when they'd run out of wine. And he said, woman, my time has not come yet. So it's not a sign of disrespect. Instead, I see another aspect that Jesus' relationship with Mary was bigger than just the fact that they were from the same family, which was great. But this one, born of Mary, would become Mary's savior. She had to look beyond her own grief to the realization that he was dying for her and for her sins and for the sins of mankind. And I think Jesus wanted her to understand that as well. Not only that he would have his friend John take care of her, but that Mary understands that she's not just his mother, but that she's a recipient of his salvation by believing in him. So what have we seen so far? We've only gone through the first three. What do we see? We see forgiveness offered, divine forgiveness, and release from responsibility. We've seen salvation that's been given to one who was undeserving of it. And yet Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. And we see responsibility and relationship between Jesus and his own mother. All right. Let's sing another song together, can we? If you have a hymnal, let's turn to number 84. I want to say thank you to Judy. Judy was willing to play today. My daughter, who normally plays, said to me earlier this week, well, Dad, I have to work today. (laughs) I can't do the Good Friday service. And so Judy willingly uh, stepped in, and we're thankful for that. So if you want to turn to number 84, we're going to sing the verses of this song, Beneath the Cross of Jesus.
Thank you for that good singing. All right, we're going to do uh, the fourth now of the words of Jesus. And this one is uh, what I would call a really turning point. He's in the midst of being on the cross. And this is recorded in Mark. It's actually recorded in the book of Mark and in the book of Matthew twice. Let's, Mark's uh, record is in chapter 15, verses 33 and 34, where he's, it says this, Now when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, that means from about noon till 3 p.m. Oftentimes in our churches when we were younger, if you remember, we would have a Good Friday service at noon, and sometimes it lasted three hours. In fact, I was talking to uh, Karen yesterday. She said, you used to get the time off from from the bank, right, to go to church, yeah. So, uh, but here it is, now from when the sixth hour had come and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sambanthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, earlier Jesus had said, Father, forgive them, hadn't he? He doesn't call him Father this time, does he? In fact, he echoes the words of the psalmist in Psalm 22. It's the very first verse in Psalm 22. He echoes those very words of David. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And what we see here is we see this is the time on the cross where Jesus became the sin bearer. Paul describes it this way in 2 Corinthians 5.21. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us in order that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And I would say this. Earlier Jesus had offered to this uh, this um, robber, a place in paradise. And how was Jesus able to offer that to him? Because Jesus knew that his very purpose on earth was to come and die for the sins of mankind. So what does that mean to us here today? That means that Jesus bore your sin and he bore my sin in his body on the tree. Jesus Christ took on the sin of the world. And the Bible says that God, who is a righteous God and a just God, God who is a holy God, cannot look at sin. And so what had to happen for this moment on the cross, God could not look at his son because Jesus was bearing the sins of the world on the cross. And so for this brief moment, there was a time when Jesus was abandoned by the Father. And Jesus cries out because he knows he is the sin bearer. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There is a judgment for sin, my friends. And the judgment for sin is separation from God. The wages of sin is death. And Jesus took on death. Jesus took on all the evils of sin. He took on all the penalty of sin for you and me. And at this moment on the cross, even the Father had to turn his back on him because he was the sin bearer. Jesus bore, his, bore our sin in his body on the tree. Fortunately, it did not stay there. So for the, the fifth word of Jesus is this word. It's only two words, or it could be translated another way. But he said, I thirst. And this is recorded in John 19 where he says this. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scriptures might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. Now, it's interesting to note earlier they had offered him some wine with vinegar, 
and he refused it. And you know why he did? Because that particular thing they were going to give him would be like a drug, like a stupor that would not allow him to really know all things that were going on to him. And he did not want to like have a painkiller during the cross. He suffered all the pain of the cross. But here then, the scripture says, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. I'm going to turn to a couple passages in the Psalms. One is Psalm 22 again. Listen to how the writer David is talking about his own situation, but uh, actually prophesies about the Lord Jesus. Psalm 22, verse 15 says this, My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaves to my jaws. Does it sound like he's thirsty? <laughs> my tongue cleaves to my jaws. And then Psalm uh, 69, verse 11. Verse 21, I'm sorry. Psalm 69, verse 21 says this. They also gave me gall for my food, and for my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. He fulfilled the scriptures, didn't he? He fulfilled the scriptures knowing that all prophecy was done now, and he thirsted. I can imagine, physically speaking, he had gone through all the agony of losing blood. It started at the Garden of Gethsemane when he was praying to the Father. The Bible says he sweat drops of blood. It was so uh, emotionally draining for him. In fact, the Bible says there in Luke 20. Uh, 22, that an angel had to come and minister to him at the garden. He might have fainted if he hadn't been there. And then we know that he was whipped, and so there was blood that was pouring from his back. We know that he had a crown of thorns on his head, and there was blood pouring from his head. And so he had lost all kinds of fluid, and he's on the cross, and the Bible says that he was thirsty. In fact, Jesus said himself, I thirst. And so they offered him uh, this vinegar, and they, and they put it on hyssop, and uh, he drank it. And one of the reasons we might think he drank it is because he had two more things to say. He needed to prepare himself for those things. So number six. Number six, we know this one's probably as the best known of all the, ver the words of Jesus. This is recorded in John 19, verse 30. And when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is what? It's finished. To tell us thy, that's in Greek. It means it's done. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. So uh, it is finished. In, in um, jurisprudence during that time, if someone were guilty of some particular crime, of something they had done, they would have a charge written against them. It would be like on a chalkboard, but they didn't do it in chalk. But they would write something again, and the man would have to carry this. Okay? I'm guilty of stealing whatever I did, and I have this, this many years to pay that particular fine or to pay that in jail. And one day, if the man fulfilled the responsibility of his jail sentence or whatever he did, they would actually take a, like a stamp, and they would stamp to tell us die on that particular parchment. And that meant it's finished. It meant whatever that what needed to be paid on that man's criminal record was paid. It was finished. And so if he was walking around town and someone said, I thought you were supposed to be in jail, he'd say, no, no, it's finished. He could show his, the record. And so as we consider what Jesus said here, <laughs> Jesus paid the cost. Paul says that he, he, he canceled the record for us. And so the, the judgment against us has been paid. And so when Satan comes to us and says, hey, look at you, you terrible sinner, and we can say, yeah, I'm a terrible sinner, but my Christ, he paid for it, and it's finished. The judgment for my sin has been paid. It's finished. All that needed to be accomplished for us to be reconciled to God has been accomplished by Jesus Christ. Therefore, he could proclaim from the cross, it is finished. 
One day when we stand before Jesus, if Jesus might ask us or the Father might ask us, why should I let you into heaven? You know what we could say? Because it's finished. It's finished. All right. So just John's recording. Luke records one other word from Jesus, and it's found in chapter 23, verses 44 through 46. This is the last of the seven words where it says, Now it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. Then the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. In other words, it used to be that only the high priest went once a year into the temple and not without a sacrifice. And now that veil was gone. In fact, it wasn't torn from the bottom to the top. It was torn from the top to the bottom. Jesus restored access to the Father. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Relationship had been restored. He started with Father of the first of the seven verses. And now at the end he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. All that needed to be accomplished, it was finished, and now I can come back to you. And the Bible says, having said this, he breathed his last. How did Jesus die? Well, there are people that have speculated he died because of a broken heart. He died because of a lack of oxygen. There was all kinds of things we could possibly say, physically speaking. But you know, it's interesting, as Jesus was speaking in John chapter 10, listen to what he said. He's talking to his disciples. It's in the passage when he talks about he's the good shepherd. But he says in John chapter 10, he says, No, uh, therefore my father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have the power to lay it down and I have the power to take it again. This is the command I have received from my Father. You know what that means? That at the end of this time, when he was about ready to die, he could have said, I don't want to finish it. I don't want to die. He could have stopped it right there. But it, Jesus laid down his life, and no one took it from it. him. He says in John 18, I lay it down of myself. And so the Bible says he gave up the ghost in the King James. He gave up his spirit. And, and died for us. So what do we learn? What do we learn from the seven words of Jesus? What a glorious gospel is found for us in what he told us while he was on the cross. And we can rejoice today because all that was done by Jesus was done for us. Like we said at the beginning, therefore we can call it Good Friday, can't we? Good Friday. All right, I want to give an opportunity before we close today. Is there anyone who would like to comment on either one of the words of Jesus or something that you've been thinking about in regards to our Lord today? Anyone with a comment today? Yes, sir. I can comment on the, the last words that the, one of the most Christian ladies I ever knew said. She had uh, very bad heart problems, and she was unconscious for several days in the hospital. And about 2 o'clock in the morning, the nurse came into the room, and her husband was in the room, and she sat up in bed and said, Less. Isn't it so beautiful? Laid back down and died. Hmm. Edith Keel. She saw the glory of heaven coming, didn't she? Didn't she? Yeah. All right. Thank you. Anyone else? Did you want to say something, Gabe? Okay. Yes, Doris. 
I'm going to try to be strong to say this. As a mother that lost a son and watched him die, I was there with him alone, but I knew I was not alone because I knew the father was right there with me. And I did think Mary would lose in Jesus. And every time I do, I think that, every time at this time, I think of that. It's just heartfelt. And I can just only imagine the pain and the suffering that he felt, but also that she watched and felt. When we think about it, it's just so amazing what he did on that cross for every single one of us. And I cannot fully, at any point, understand how anyone cannot understand or have their faith. It just hurts. And we are thankful, every one of us, for everything that he's ever done for all of us. Amen. 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 Thank you, Doris. Anyone else? One of the exercises that I try to do each uh, Holy Week every year is to read through the Gospel accounts, you know. And so even today and tomorrow and, and especially Sunday on the last chapters of the Gospels, we read the, the crucifixion accounts, the passion of our Lord, and then we rejoice in His resurrection. And that's why we'll be together again on Sunday to rejoice in His resurrection. Anyone else? I received today two different prayer requests. I'm just going to read them. Helen uh, Luchard said uh, to pray for Sue Mitchell, who uh, has cancer, and she was at the hospital and fell. And you said she broke what? Her arm? Broke her arm. So let's pray for Sue Mitchell today. And then uh, Bill Daly, am I saying that right? Bill Daly uh, has cancer in his eye. It is returned. So we wanna, how is he related to you, or is he just a friend? He's a friend from the law. Okay. Bill Daly. I, I was, uh, most of you know uh, our friends, uh, Don and Marilyn Wilson. Don is the one that comes and has a hard time sitting because he's had surgery on his uh, hip. Um, they were, uh, last week I reported that they thought he had pneumonia, but actually what they found was that he has cancer at the bottom of his esophagus. And the reason why it looked like pneumonia is because when he would swallow, the water would go down the wrong tubes. It went down into his lungs. So they thought it was pneumonia, but it wasn't pneumonia. So he's had, a, um, he's had an actual um, feeding tube put in his stomach because he hasn't been able to eat. And I, I'm hearing, in fact, um, Joan just told me a few minutes ago that she thought he was coming home today. So we'll pray for Dawn as well. So let's lift these before. Is there anyone else that has another request you'd like me to pray before we close today? All right, let's turn to God, can we? Father in heaven, we come before you with joy in our hearts, looking once again at the sufferings of Jesus in the midst of the cross and how he gave us great and endless hope because he offered us this salvation first to the thief on the cross, but all of us because you finished the work of God in bringing about salvation. And so, Lord, we rejoice in you, and we're thankful for your willingness to suffer for us. And we say, God, thank you for all that you have done. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. And, Lord, today, as we've heard these requests, we, we want to bring them before you. Certainly there are others that we have in our hearts, but I want to specifically bring Bill Daly today to you as, as this cancer has returned in his eye. And I want to pray for Sue Mitchell, who has cancer and is dealing with that, but now has also a broken arm. And we pray, Lord God, that you would minister to her there. Bless Helen as she helps to take care of her as well. And I want to pray today and bring both Dawn and Marilyn Wilson before you. Dawn, who has this cancer now and is going to be facing treatment, I pray that you would give his body ability to be healed of this cancer in his esophagus. And I pray, Lord God, for the other issues he faces with his mobility. I pray that you administer to that as well. And for 
Marilyn, as she deals with the issues in her neck and the strength of her muscles there, we pray that you would bless them. And as they make decisions as to where the treatment's going to take place, give them wisdom from on high, and may, the, may they listen to your counsel. So thank you, Lord, that we can bring these requests before you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand together with me, receive the benediction, and you'll be dismissed. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. God bless you today. Go in peace. Thank you.